God doesn't change, but he does have a calendar. And it's a rather big calendar. You know, there's dates on it like creating space and time. The era where dinosaurs roamed the earth and stopped roaming the earth. And of course, the ones made in his own image, God's prized possession, mankind. To the fall of mankind, thanks to Adam and Eve in the garden of, well, you know how the story goes. To our present time, mankind's redemption, hence the prophets like Moses given the law, all leading to God's plan from the beginning, walking among us to die for the sin of his creation. But what many people don't realize is that God's calendar didn't stop. In fact, there are so many important redemptive dates on his calendar that many of which occur without us even noticing. But this is a story about a man who did notice a date on God's calendar and what he decided to do about it. Hey, Good you. happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. How you doing, man? Good to you. Happy birthday. Appreciate Good. it. Thanks. Welcome, hey, Daniel. Hey, Good to see you, buddy. And that at 8 p.m., there's going to be another gathering, just a vision of the sand. But he said that's totally voluntary for you. That's not something that you have to go to. And then he said that they would break into a time of prayer. So that's at 8 o'clock on Friday, and then Saturday we hit the ground running. Your first stadium, you're at Alliance at 10.15, and then just... Which is here in Sao Paulo. Right, yep. Welcome to Sao Paulo. Where the dining is more than fine. Where the police are dope. And where they take street art Seriously. We're starting the series off in Sao Paulo, Brazil, because something special is happening here tomorrow. A Christian event called The Scent. A movement that fills stadiums across the globe to send missionaries around the world. The first send that took place in Orlando packed a 65,000 seat stadium. One, two, three. When you hit 10 at night at the end of a 12 hour event and no one wants to leave, something went right. And with the success that they had in Orlando, they decided to be even more ambitious here in Brazil. Because this event isn't just happening in one stadium, nor two stadiums, but three stadiums simultaneously across the country. The first two being here in Sao Paulo, and the third, which we'll be flying 500 miles to get to, is in the capital of the country, Brasilia. And as amazing as all of that is, that's not the main reason I came here. I actually came here to conduct an interview as soon as this event concludes with this man, Daniel Colenda. Who's a key speaker at all three stadiums of the Sen. Brazil shall be saved! But before we go any further, let me introduce myself. My name is Chris Worthington. 
part of the documentary. And I've been making movies pretty much my entire life. And long story short, I went from filming me and my friends trying to stay out of trouble in our hometown to filming things like this. To explain why I want to interview Daniel, we're going to have to go back to 1997. We're at a local church in Northern Everybody. Florida. A revival was taking place. This revival began on Father's Day, 1995. Steve Hill was a visiting evangelist passing through town. Pastor John Kilpatrick invited him to his pulpit for the morning service. On Father's Day, the power of God fell. a skinhead. I used to hate anybody who wasn't white. God saved me, set me free. In Pensacola, Florida, a religious spectacle is underway. Night after night, people from all over the world come by the thousands, hoping for a divine encounter. The wait is finally over. It is showtime. And amongst those in attendance, was a 16-year-old, Daniel Colenda, who while being there, would receive a word from God that would change his life forever. That one day, he would work with a German evangelist named Reinhard Bonnke. When I was 16 years old, I was part of a revival. At that revival, there was a lady visiting by the name of Suzette Hatting. She was, for many years, Reinhard Bonnke's head intercessor. Now, I'd never heard of Suzette. I'd never heard of Reinhard. I'd never heard of any of this stuff. And I was a 16-year-old kid in a revival service. They, they asked her to come up and to pray, just to open the meeting in prayer, just like an opening. And so she began to pray. And Jean, I remember feeling like the air was filled with electricity. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me very clearly. And he said, you're going to work with that man that she had mentioned, which was Reinhard Bonnke. How can a cripple forget his clutches? How mal in the waka if you forget his tiko waka? A cripple may forget his wife, he may forget his children, he may forget his money, but he cannot forget his crutches. Which came to pass years later, when Daniel not only came to work with Reinhardt, but became the president and CEO of Reinhard Bonnke's ministry in 2009. I have passed the torch to Daniel Kulenda. And to bring this story to a full circle, the recent news that broke just before this event was that Reinhard Bonnke went home to be with the Lord. Hence my interest in interviewing Daniel as soon as I could. My name is Dan Kulenda. I'm from Port Charlotte. Um, I was baptized when I was seven or eight years old. And even though I love God with all my heart, I ran after the world because I thought it had something that it could give me. I'm here to tell you tonight that the world has nothing. The world is full of just counterfeit pleasure. But how many know that the kingdom of God is full of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost? I'm here tonight because I'm sick of living in mediocrity. I'm sick of living halfway for Jesus. I'm sick of having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And tonight, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bury that old man 
has been tying me down. I'm going to live my life full out for Jesus Christ. morning of the event, we hopped in our designated van and headed to Daniel's first stadium of the day. Hey everybody, it's Daniel coming to you live from Sao Paulo, Brazil. We're driving over right now to the stadium where the send has already begun, I believe. We actually set a record for the stadium for the fastest selling out of that stadium in its history. The, the second place was U2 and, and Coldplay. I, I don't think it's that we did such a great or job organizing. I don't think it's that the Send branding is so cool. Although all those things are true, but that they cannot be the explanation for this. And look, I'm not gonna lie. After we arrived and walked under the stadium, and I heard the roar of the crowd through several layers of concrete above my head. I got nervous. But Daniel, not nervous at all, simply walked out from underground and took center stage. As Daniel took the stage and began to preach, I started to realize just how different Daniel's job really is. For those of you who don't know this, Daniel's continent isn't usually South America. As the president and CEO of Christ for All Nations, Daniel preaches to some of the largest crowds in the world. And not just crowds of hundreds of thousands, but many times crowds of millions. I am not afraid of the devil. The devil is afraid of me. The devil is afraid of me because I am marked by the blood of Jesus. And he himself has led over 22 million people to Christ. And side note, accomplished all of this before his 40th birthday. If you wanna go, you can. I mean, you have to sign some waivers. <laughs> we arrived at the second stadium of the day, and I followed Daniel and his assistant up to the stage. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily to follow me. Your pastor cannot save you. The, não pode te salvar. the sand cannot save the you. Sand não pode te salvar. An altar call cannot save you. Uma belo altar não pode te salvar. Only Jesus can Só save Jesus you. Jesus pode te salvar. Here we go. Ryan Harbonke used to declare in Africa that Brazil shall be saved in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. How many of you know we are living in the season of harvest? Quem aqui entende que nós estamos numa temporada de colheita? Amos chapter number 9. I believe this is a word for Brazil. Chapter 9 verse 13. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. 
that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes will overtake the one who sows the seed e o que pisa as uvas é o que lança a semente i want to show you in modern language the picture that Amos is giving us. Eu quero te dar numa imagem do que a linguagem dos dias de hoje o que Amos está falando aqui. Ele fala, ó, vai vir um dia quando aquele que está plantando as sementes ele vai ser tomado por aquele que está trabalhando na colheita. The harvest will be so multiplied that we cannot keep up with it. Que a gente não vai nem dar para colheita. Truly is plentiful. Porque a colheita está pronta. But the laborers are few. Mas os trabalhadores são poucos. So Jesus said pray. Então Jesus diz ora. Pray. Ora. Pray. Ora. Everybody say pray. Todo mundo diz ora. And just like that, we left to get to our next destination, a private airport. Spend your life trying to make all your money. For our flight to the third stadium. This is Emerson, he's our Brazilian director. Now up to this point, all I knew was someone had given us a plane for the day. So in my mind, it was gonna be a small prop plane like this. Well, this is not great for the hairdo. But my prediction was proven completely wrong when we walked out onto the tarmac Obrigado. and saw this. So we just boarded uh, a plane, a private jet, as you can see, and we're on our way to Brasilia. We don't usually fly private jets, <laughs> believe me. We landed in Brasilia and headed to Daniel's last stadium so that he could preach once more. Jesus Christ! Have mercy on me and save me now. E salva me agora. And everybody said, e todo Amen, mundo diz Amen. 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 Come on, put your hands together oh, for Jesus. Levanta suas mãos, aplauda o Senhor essa noite. When we lift this shout, quando você levantar o teu tênis aí, a new fire is going to touch you. Um novo fogo vai te tocar. The glory is going to fall. A glória vai cair. The event concluded, and once again, no one wanted to leave. So we left and drove straight to the closest airport to catch Daniel's flight back to Orlando, where I had the opportunity to finally ask him a few questions in the car. All right, so today I was on uh, YouTube and I was watching Billy Graham on Larry King. Larry King asked Billy, uh, what is your purpose? 
I just want to ask you that same question. What is your purpose? Wow. Uh, I don't think I don't think anybody's ever asked me that before. Um, it's one word, and that is multiply. Uh, I really felt like the Lord said it's time to multiply for the sake of the harvest. So I'm not just out there trying to, you know, have a big ministry and um, do a good job preaching. What I want to do is I want to see a whole generation raised up and sent out, so that when my time is over. Um, you know, no one's no one's lamenting the fact that I've passed because there's tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people that are running with that torch and have received that mantle. I have this feeling in my heart: if I just give back what He's given to me, um, it's not it's not good enough. There's there's I, f- I have this feeling it's got to be multiplied, and such an incredible investment has been put in my hands from Reinhard Bonnke and from you know, Peter Vandenberg and all these that have spent their whole lives building this thing, and now it's in my hands. I've got to do more with it than just preach. I've got to, I've got to utilize it to um, launch a whole generation in this thing. That's the only appropriate response. Okay, so if you could tell me one misconception that you think people have about you, what would that be? The, the travel is not romantic to me. I get nothing out of flying around. I've been to 80 some countries, probably 90 some by now. I haven't counted in a long time. But I mean, I don't get any thrill out of that. I, I, I don't even get a thrill out of like the things you'd think, like being on a stage in front of a bunch of people. It does nothing for me. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, the, it's what God has asked you to do and you're doing it in obedience. The thrill is in being obedient. Um, I think a lot of people just look at this and they think, you know, that that's such a glamorous life and you know, he's, he should feel lucky and stuff. I mean, it's, it's very blessed and I'm very glad that God has called me to this. I wouldn't want to do anything else. But there's a, there is actually a price to pay for this, at least in my life. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't, don't see that. No, no. Or they don't get it because I think people think, like, like for some people to stand on a stage in front of 80,000 people in a stadium would be like their life's dream. And again, it's, I don't, I don't know why God picked me for this, because it's not, it, it never was my dream. And to do it is cool, but it's like, it doesn't make, it doesn't thrill me. It doesn't give me some sense of purpose in life. You're still rolling? Yeah. He, he, what he's talking about is, um, our crusade director in Nigeria is not happy with me at the moment because, um, I was, I was supposed to go straight from here, right? I'm supposed to go straight from Brazil to Nigeria for the crusade, but I'm gonna go home for a day in between to see my family. And he's, he's saying that the, some of the local pastors and some of the bishops and organizers are gonna be upset because they wanted to do like some dinners and some protocol stuff. They probably wanted to invite the local dignitaries and officials of the government or whatever, and I'm not gonna be there. So that's probably not gonna happen. Um, I'm going to, instead of going and eating with a king in Africa, I'm going to go eat with my kids. And I, I actually think that's a good choice. You know, when I'm on my deathbed, none of these bishops are going to be there. You know? Yeah. This may be because this was my first time traveling with Daniel. But throughout this trip, what I found more intriguing than getting on a private jet and standing in front of three stadiums was Daniel himself. I was surprised to see that he believes that God is asking him to do even more than he already is, namely multiplying a generation of evangelists. I concluded not only is his perspective on his life's mission completely different than I thought, but he carries the weight of being away from his family all over the world with him. But I think his response to my question after I shut the camera off really shows his heart better than anything. I asked him, you've traveled the whole globe. You've seen more places than most people see in their entire lifetime. If you could travel anywhere in the world, where would you go? He looked at me, paused, and said, home.
Join me on the next episode as I fly straight to Nigeria to witness a CFAN gospel crusade for myself. We're on the way. We all land in the wrong countries. We almost die on this highway. And where I watch the sun fall out of the sky to see what Daniel's evangelistic life really looks like. Hello again. If you're watching this, you've just finished watching episode one of Multiplied. Let us know what you thought in the comments below. There's so much more to the story and we can't wait for you to see all of the episodes. Every link you'll need to do that can be found in the description. Until next time, I'll see you soon. See you soon is kind of lame. Yeah. Until next time, stay classy, San Diego. Uh, uh, um, I'll see you when I see you. In I'll a while, crocodile. In a while, crocodile. Yeah. Catch you later, alligator. Catch you later, alligator. Until next time, catch you later, alligator. <laughs>